Which one? Oh, welcome and happy Sabbath, everyone. <laughs> oh, praise God, praise God. It is good to be back again to our School of the Prophets. It's good to also be back just together here to uh, sing, to study, and to pray. I'm just glad that the week is, uh, is coming to its end right now, and we could just rest. I don't know about you, but my week was pretty victorious, generally, overall, but it was a battle, so now I'm a little bit drained mentally, physically, even spiritually a little, spiritually a little bit, but I'm grateful for this time where we could rest. You know, Sister Bree was saying how, like, it's like we just saw each other just, and it was just Sunday. You know, time just, like, flies, like, so quickly. Yeah, thank God. Sometimes, right? Thank God. I mean, it's always those precious moments that you want to last forever, but they go on so quickly. Uh, but when it comes to the Sabbath, God, you know, blessed us with from Friday sundown and all of Saturday and until Saturday, Sabbath sundown. But, you know, we take it for the whole entire day. So we're grateful for that. So I just want to begin with a word of prayer. Oh, and I also want to welcome all of you uh, viewing us online. I pray that God has continued to richly bless you as you've been uh, following along with us here in our school, of the prophets. So tonight we just want to sing, open the Sabbath together. Uh, pray and also get into our study tonight with Brother Sheldon. And I believe that tonight's study is promising to be a very special one because we're going to be studying an individual who actually walked up to heaven without seeing death. We've been studying the seven angels. We've been studying the covenants. We've been studying um, the 140 and 4,000. And this individual that we're going to be studying with Brother Sheldon is a type of those who will be the 144,000. So we're going to be studying, and I believe God is going to open our eyes to many things. So um, before we get into that, we just want to have a word of prayer, sing a couple of songs, because God has just been so good to us, and then we'll get into tonight's study. So I'll just kneel, just to uh, open up with prayer, and then we'll sing. Father in heaven, we want to thank you tonight for the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with this Sabbath to be able to rest and not look at the issues that we faced throughout the week, but look at the victories that you have given to us. And to consider the fact that through all the difficulties and the trials and the, diffi- and the, and the hardships that we have gone through, and even the joys uh, uh, and the praiseworthy moments that we've had, he's been with us all along. And for that, Lord, we say thank you so much. So this Sabbath, Lord, we want to again rest in you as we did last Sabbath. We want to rest in you, and we want to increase our experience with you, not by might nor by strength, but by your Holy Spirit. So God, it's my prayer that you would fill this place with your Holy Spirit and fill our hearts as well. We ask all these things in the precious. Oh, we also ask all those that are on the way, Father, that you may be with them, all those that are viewing online and who will view in the next few moments. We ask that you may prepare the soil of their hearts as we will be uh, considering Christ tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So to begin, we'll sing, um, we are marching to Zion. We're marching to Zion. What number is that, marching to Zion? 422. 422, okay, 422. You guys sound really excited about that one. We'll sing number 422, marching to Zion. I, I know that this week might have been a tough march for some of us. Uh, some of us may have stepped on, into some cracks, maybe twisted our ankle a little bit or walked into some potholes, but that's all right. We're taking steps with Christ, and we are marching to Zion. So let's sing that song, number 422, Marching to Zion. Two, three. Come we that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord, join in a song with sweet accord, and thus surround the throne, and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. Zion, we're marching upward to heavenly Zion, that beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing, 
who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King may speak, their joys abroad may speak, their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to heavenly Zion, that beautiful city of God, the hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets. Before we reach the heavenly field, before we reach the heavenly field, or walk the golden streets, or walk the golden streets. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to heavenly Zion, that beautiful city of God. We're marching, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to heavenly Zion, the beautiful city of God. Hey, Amen. I'm loving that bass, Brother Silas. I'm loving that bass. Yes, it's proper. Uh, let's sing the number 515. I really like this song, 515. It says, the Lord is my light. Then why should I fear? By day and by night, his presence is near. He is my salvation from sorrow and sin. The blessed persuasion the Spirit brings in. The Lord is my light. Number 515. Two, three. The Lord is my light, then why should I fear by day and by night? His presence is near. He is my salvation from sorrow and sin. This cleansed it persuasion the Spirit brings in. The Lord is my light, my joy, and my song. By day and by night, He leads me alone. The Lord is my light, my joy, and my song. By day and by night, he leads me along. The Lord is my light, though clouds may arise. Faith stronger than sight looks up to the skies. When Jesus forever in glory doth reign, then how can I ever in darkness remain? The Lord is my light, my joy, and my song. By day and by night he leads me along. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song, by day and by night, he leads me along. The Lord is my light, the Lord is my strength, I know he is my, I'll conquer at length. My weakness and mercy he covered with power, and walking by faith he upholds me each hour. The Lord is my light, my joy, and my song. By day and by night he leads me along. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night, he leads me along. 
The Lord is my light, my all and in all. There is in his sight no darkness at all. He is my Redeemer, my Savior and King. With saints and with angels he praises I sing. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night he leads me along. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night he leads me along. Amen. I believe that God has been leading us has been leading us for a very, very long time. And, you know, it's, it's, it's in reviewing what God has done for us over the past, you know, three, four, five years and studying and, and coming closer to him and a knowledge of his truth that, you know, you sing these songs and they start meaning more and more to you as each day goes by. And you really just grow in confidence that no matter what is, you know, whatever trouble may come my way, or whatever obstacle or a big wall or a mountain may stand in front of me, well, God has been leading me all along. Uh, so whatever it is that may befall me, I need not worry because, because he's just going to make me go through this. In the book of Isaiah, it says that he will help us to go through the fire whereby we won't be burned. You know, And through all the difficulties of life, and we will be able to, to come out with as perfect Christians, but that only works when we look at Christ, because the Bible says that it's by beholding that we become changed. So as we behold Christ, as he's leading us along the way, we become perfect Christians. We continue to walk that walk, even as our brother Enoch, who we're going to be studying in a little bit. But um, I still have a couple of songs that I believe that we just got to get off of our chest. I want to sing number 516, where it says, this is the following song, which is the following number, 516, all the way, my Savior leads me. He's led us all the way throughout this week up to the, up to the Sabbath right now. It's so great to be able to open the Sabbath um, and usher Christ into our hearts and all the angels into this place. It's number 516, all the way my Savior leads me. Two, three. All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, Feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, And my soul a thirst may be, Gushing from the rock before me, Lo, a spring of joy I see. Gushing from the rock before me, Lo, a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, Oh, the fullness of his love, Perfect rest for you me is promised In my Father's house above. When I wake to life immortal, wing my flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. 
This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. Amen. Just before we have um, Brother Sheldon come up to do um, to bring us into tonight's study, we just want to have a word of prayer to usher in the Sabbath. I'm very, very grateful. Do you realize that? Over, over 6,000 years ago, like after God said, you know, you know, created, you know, the light and everything else, and then man on, on the sixth day, and on the seventh day, he rested. Like, over 6,000 years ago, the sun was created, and the moon, and the stars, and the earth, and the Sabbath started on the seventh day. And when you look up at the sun, that's that same sun from over 6,000 years ago that was created and, 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 well, the sun is not an intelligent being like we are that can keep the Sabbath, but, but when that Sabbath was kept, the sun was there. You see what I'm saying? Like, like, like when, if you go back to the time of, of Babylon, like the Sabbath was kept by God's people then. If you go further back to the time of, of Moses, you see the Sabbath was kept, and that sun was right there. If you go further back to the time of even Enoch or even further to um, Adam and Eve, like that sun was there when they opened the Sabbath. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not suggesting sun worship at all, not even a little bit. But I'm just making the point that, that, that these things were here and now we're here, able to enjoy and be grateful for those things that God has created all the way back then. And to look over not only our life, but the fact that God, that God spoke and those things came to pass. And it's, in, it, and it's in him and his word that we can rest because that sun is still there. Because all those things are still there. We can rest assured that when we rest on the Sabbath, we are resting with God and all of our problems are being taken care of by him. That's why we don't have to make phone calls or, or try to handle our business on the Sabbath. No, it's that time to rest and God is taking care, care of everything else in the background. So I, I just want to, you know, um, I have a word of prayer right now as we're going to usher in the Sabbath. Then we'll sing a, 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 a particular song that was requested. Hover over me, Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, we'll sing one stanza of that. Then we'll pray. Then we'll sing the final stanza. Number 260, hover over me, Holy Spirit. 2, 3. Hover o'er me, Holy Spirit, bathe my trembling heart and brow. Fill me with thy hallowed presence. Come, O oh come, and fill me now. Fill me now, fill me now, Jesus come and fill me now, fill me with thy hallowed presence, come, O oh come, and fill me now. Father in heaven, we pause again to thank you for the Sabbath day, for this time that you've carved out of the week to spend with us, for this time that you have especially dedicated to spend with your intelligent creatures, to be able to commune and to reason with us, to be able to enlighten our minds to the various victories that you've given us that we may not see, to open our minds to the various instances where you have delivered us from death, where you have delivered us from falling into sin. We thank you, Father, for this Sabbath day where we can just look at you and your goodness towards us. Lord, right now we just ask that you may cleanse us of all of our sins and all of our unrighteousness. So that in holiness, we can keep your holy Sabbath hours, not merely as a form, God, but in spirit and in truth. Lord, we would not be as 
people who have a form of godliness denying the power thereof. Lord, we are sick and tired of putting on a facade that we are Christians when really on the inside we live like devils, we think like devils, and we act like them as well. Lord, we want a true change in our heart. We're grateful to be able to know that which will come to pass. We're grateful to be able to see what's going to happen in the future and understand the position that you would have us in over there. But God, we're in a position right now where we need a change so that we can fulfill the position that you have for us back over there in the future. So we ask, Lord, that in our hearts you may make us true Christians, that in our hearts you may make us true believers. Father, help our unbelief. Many of us have many struggles. Many of us have many difficulties that we can't utter. And if we do utter it, there are no human ears that can understand or can, that can sympathize with us. But your word has enlightened us to the fact that you became us. And in coming into our experience, you know just what we're going through. And you've gone through it with us. And you're seeking, you're seeking to go through it with us even now. So Lord, we would open our hearts as Christ has been knocking all along. We would follow your leading as you have sought to be our guide all along. Lord, we would receive the showers of your Holy Spirit as it is hovering over, as he is hovering over us even at this very moment. Lord, fill our hearts with your spirit of rest at this present time that we may sense and realize a peace beyond all understanding, even now, God. We've been having these classes for the past several weeks, and we continue to have these classes. Lord, it's my prayer that we would not become lukewarm, that this may not become a routine, but that every class that we have, we may take one step closer, even as Enoch, to the heavenly gates, that after every single study, we may realize much more just what it is that you are trying to accomplish for us and with us. Oh, God, we need much more of you. And so during this Sabbath, God, we're, be, we're going to be looking for you. We're going to be expecting great and awesome things from you. Lord, we thank you for the promises that you've made for us in your word that you will give it to us as we have asked. According to thy will, in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thou canst fill me, gracious spirit, though I cannot tell thee how, but I need thee greatly need. Thee come, O oh come, and fill me now, fill me now, fill me now. Jesus, come and fill me now, fill me with thy hallowed presence, come. Oh, come and fill me now. Let's go to verse 4. Cleanse and comfort, bless and save me. Bathe, oh, bathe my heart and brow. Thou art comforting and saving. Thou art sweet. Filling now, fill me now, fill me now. Jesus, come and fill me now, fill me with thy hollow presence. Come, oh, come. And fill me now. Amen.
Good night, everyone. Good evening, brother. And happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I must say that I'm truly happy and grateful to be back here mm -hmm. at the School of the Prophets. Amen. Amen. I believe that thus far with Brother Michael, Brother Paul, and uh, Pastor Koku this past Sunday, that everyone has been richly blessed. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe that the Lord has a lot in store for us uh, tonight, as well as next Friday, um, based on what the Lord, I believe, he has put on my heart to share. Now, before I pray... As you can look on the screen, you'll see that the title of our message tonight is Living the Life of Enoch, Walking with the Invisible God. Mm -hmm. Living the Life of Enoch, Walking with the Invisible God. We are told in inspiration that Enoch lived in one of the most uh, destructive times of our Earth's history. And as we know, um, I believe that we do remember that last year we did study the watches, amen? amen? Now, for those who said amen, do we remember what watch we're living in presently right now? The midnight watch. The midnight watch. Midnight Praise night. God. And in the book Christ, after the lesson, we are told that uh, the darkness that is in this world is as a result of the misapprehension of God. And so living in this midnight watch right now, we're actually living in the most darkest time of Earth's history. And so if you're living in the darkest time of Earth's history, this means that there must be a correlation with the way that Enoch lived and the way that we ought to live. And so we pray that the Lord's presence will be with us as we look into this study to see just exactly how Enoch had a relationship with the invisible God. Please kneel with me as we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are truly thankful for your love, your mercy, and your grace. We are so thankful that you have guided us and protected us throughout this past week. We're thankful, O oh God, for all the messages that have went forth already in this school of the prophets. And we ask, Holy Father, that as we look into this study tonight, your Holy Spirit will comfort us. Your Holy Spirit will uh, guide us into all truth. We ask, Father, that you help us to understand just how Enoch walked with you. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to apply these principles to our daily lives. In Jesus' name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. <clears throat> now to begin, please turn your, your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Living the life of Enoch, walking with the invisible God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Please say amen when you have found it. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7. And the Bible says, a very simple text, it says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, when we, when we deal with the invisible God, from this text we can see that God is not comprehended by our physical senses. Mm -hmm. We cannot physically see God. We cannot physically touch him. At certain times, we cannot physically hear him. And I believe that this is exactly what the Bible says, that we ought to walk by faith and not by sight. Because there are many who believe that if I can't see it, I don't want to believe it. But if we as Christians are living that way, that means that our relationship with the Lord is going to be limited. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Dealing with the same principle. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. And the Bible says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So the Apostle Paul is saying that even though God is invisible to us physically, by looking and analyzing his, his physical creation, we can clearly see the invisible. And this is why in, in the Spirit of Prophecy we are told that there are many people who may never have sat down and read a Bible, many people who may never have actually heard a sermon, but simply by communing with God through nature, they'll be able to have a relationship with Him. Now dealing with the relationship aspect with God, there are three primary aspects not only with God, but with any relationship. There are love, trust, 
and communication. Now we're told in the book, Desire Vedic Chapter 1, I believe, that love begets love. By beholding God's love, by beholding God's goodness, by beholding His mercy, that inspires us to have love with Him. And as a result of that love that we then begin to develop with Him, we naturally begin to develop a trusting relationship with Him. Now, as a result of having a trust and relationship with him, then and only then can there be frequent communication. In any, in any relationship, husband, wife, friends, church members, anytime there's a breakdown of communication, somewhere along the line, there was a breakdown of trust. Maybe someone lied on someone. Maybe someone said something or did something behind someone's back. But the fact is that there's always some lack, uh, a lack of trust. And the lack of trust is always because those individuals have failed to reveal God's love in their life. Now, dealing with Enoch, from the book Conflict and Courage, page 30, paragraph 3, we are told, Enoch kept the Lord ever before him. He made Christ his constant companion. Now, I remember a couple of years ago when I was actually reading the book, um, Living the Life of Enoch, and the first time I read this quotation, it really stood out to me. Because usually when you see a husband or wife or you see two friends and they're always in communication, they're always um, by each other and so forth, it's only by that frequent communication that you begin to understand that these two are very close. But dealing with our physical limitations, even if you're best friend with someone, even if you're married to someone, it is impossible for you to have someone physically as a constant companion. Because you might be in a place where there's no Wi-Fi, so you can't physically uh, talk to the person. You might be in a different country, and there's you know, different complications, and it prevents you from continuously having uh, communication. But when it comes to the Lord, who can read our thoughts and everything, we can have him as a constant companion wherever we are. Now, we're also told in paragraph 4, it says, If we keep the Lord ever before us, allowing our hearts to go out in thanksgiving and praise to him, we shall have a continual freshness in our religious life. And as a result of this, our prayers will take the form of a conversation with God as we will talk with a friend. Not only that, but he will speak his mysteries to us personally. Often there will come to us a sweet, joyful sense of the presence of Jesus. Now, when it says our prayers will take the form of a conversation with God as we talk with a friend, when we are dealing with each other and so forth, primarily speaking, we speak to each other verbally. So if, if this quotation from Conflict and Courage says that our prayers will take the form of a conversation with God, that means that God's ideal is actually to speak to us audibly. Now, if you ever hear uh, Christians give their testimony, let's say that they are at a, at a physical crossroad and they did not necessarily know where to go. And they will say that, well, something told me to go left. And they eventually went left. And when they went left, they recognized that it was, a, it was actually the right path. But there are many times it is almost as if Christians are kind of afraid or shallow to say someone as opposed to something. And that's because when it comes to re the, the religious world, there's a lot of mysticism about the spiritual realm. Right, right. So there are many people who will say, well, something told me, but they don't necessarily want to personify that person, which is the Holy Spirit. So it says our prayers will take the form of a conversation with God as we will talk with a friend. He will speak his mysteries to us personally. Often there will come to us a sweet, joyful sense of the presence of Jesus. Our Higher Calling, page 55, paragraph 3. It says, suppose a friend were with us, a friend were with us, and we should meet an acquaintance on the way. So you're walking with someone, and as you're walking, you see someone that you knew from before. And direct our whole attention to our newfound acquaintance, ignoring the presence of our friend. What opinion would men have of our loyalty to our friend, of our degree of respect to him? And yet this is the way we treat Jesus. We forget that he's our companion. We engage in conversation and never mention his name. Continuing, it says, we talk of worldly business matters, like when you're in a workplace, and where it does not bruise the soul, where it is essential, we do not dishonor Jesus. But we do dishonor him 
when we fail to mention him in our intercourse with our friends and associates. Now before we go on, I know for a fact that there are many Christians who, whether they're in school or whether they're in the, in the, in the workplace, because they know if they stand up for Christ, there's going to be some barrier. People are going to begin to look at them differently. People might even begin to scorn them. So as a result of bridging that gap, we begin, we begin to be afraid to say that we love Christ. And not only, not only does she say that we are afraid to mention his name verbally, but remember, the, the name of Christ simply means his character. So there's a lot of times where you might be in a situation, and the worst thing that you can, you can actually do is to verbalize the name of Christ. Why? Because this world is very skeptical about God and about religion. So a lot of times, if you, if you mention the word Bible, if you, if you mention the, the name of Christ, people are very standoffish. That's why oftentimes it's even best to understand the principle that actions speak louder than the words, and by simply living the life of Christ, let the person think, hey, there's something different about that person. So it says, he is our best friend, and we should seek for opportunities to speak of him. We should ever keep him in view. Our conversation should be of a character that would be of no offense to God. No Gospel Workers, 1892, 422, paragraph 1. It says, we are wanting in simple faith. We need to learn the art of trusting our very best friend. Although we see him not... Jesus is watching over us with tender compassion, and he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Now, notice that the servant of the Lord is focusing on this word right here, friend. Because we know that Christ is our everlasting Father, Isaiah 9, 6. We know that he's our creator. We know that he, that he is our redeemer and so forth. But many times, I've heard many people read that quotation where it says that our prayers will take on the form of a conversation with God as with a friend. And they seem to be very skeptical as if like, no, God can't be my friend because he's my master or he's my Lord and Savior and so forth. So no one in his great need ever looked to him in faith and was disappointed. Brethren, do not express doubt. Do not let your lips utter one complaining, repining word. Begin now to fix your minds more firmly upon Jesus and heavenly things, remembering that by beholding, we become changed into the same image. Now, before I, I read this quotation in regard to parents and children, the, ne the, the next slide, I've heard many parents say in regard to their children that my child is my child and I'm not that child's friend. Yeah. Yeah. And there are many times that the only reason as to why parents are led to this conclusion is because they think that if they befriend their child, the level of respect is going to be broken down. Little do they understand that if they were to humble themselves and to get down on the level of their child and to communicate with them, it would actually bring the bond even stronger. Look at uh, James chapter 2, verse 23. James chapter 2, verse 23. James chapter 2, verse 23. James chapter 2, Verse 23, the Bible says, James chapter 2, verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the what? He was called the friend of God. Now, we know that God is our father, and yes, so, God does not say that, well, because I'm Abraham's father, I cannot befriend him. God says, I'm actually going to step down to your level and befriend you. Look at John chapter 11, verse 11. Speaking of Lazarus, John chapter 11, verse 11. John chapter 11, verse 11. It says, these things said, said he, and after that he saith unto them, our friend, Jesus speaking, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. So there's a specific pattern in the Bible where God is reminding us that he's our friend. Look at John chapter 15, verse 15. John chapter 15, verse 15. Henceforth, Jesus speaking, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. 
For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Now, the reason why Christ made a distinguishing uh, factor between a servant and a friend is because Christ understood, based on the Old Testament readings, that many, many people had a master-servant mindset when it came to God. So they had a very distant relationship with God because really and truly, a slave and a master, there's really no connection. There's really no relationship. The slave, they listen to the master, and that's about it. So Christ wanted to change their minds and say, and say listen, I understand how you were taught in the past, but I am here now to clarify a certain thing. They're saying that you are not my servant. I'm your friend. Now continuing, Adventist on page 190, paragraph 5, and 191, paragraph 1. It says, parents should encourage their children to confide in them and unburden to them their heart, their heart griefs, their little daily annoyances and trials. Kindly instruct them and bind them to your hearts. It is a critical time for children. Influences will be thrown around them to wean them from you, which you must counteract. Teach them to make you their confidant. Let them whisper in your ear their trials and joys. The reason why she mentions this is because oftentimes a child, whether the child is young, even a teenager or so forth, uh, adolescent, they don't necessarily want to speak to their parents about their personal thing that, that they are going through. Why? Because they have that same master-servant mindset with their parent. My parent is my parent. My parent can't possibly befriend me. Continuing, it says, Children would be saved from many evils, if they would be more familiar with their parents. Parents should encourage in their children a disposition to be open and frank with them, to come to them with their difficulties and, when they are perplexed as to what course is right, to lay the matter just as they view it before their parents and ask their advice. Who are so well calculated to see and point out their dangers as godly parents? Who can understand the peculiar temperaments of their own children as well as they? The mother who has watched every turn of the mind from infancy and is thus acquainted with a natural disposition is best prepared to counsel her children. Who can tell as well what traits of character to check and restrain as a mother aided by the father? Now, Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 776, paragraph 1. There are few who rightly appreciate or improve the precious privilege of prayer. We should go to Jesus and tell him all our needs. We may bring him our little cares and perplexities as well as our greater troubles. Many times we only think that God wants to deal with us about the big problems and the little problems we tend to try to take on ourselves as if we can bear it. Whatever rises to disturb or distress us, we should take it to the Lord in prayer. When we feel that we need the presence of Christ at every step, Satan will have little opportunity to intrude his temptations. It is his studied effort to keep us away from our best and most sympathizing friend. We should make no one our confidant but Christ, but Jesus. And we're going to look at this a little further. We can safely commune with him of all that is in our hearts. Everyone needs a practical experience in trusting God for himself. Let no man become your confessor. Open the heart to God. Tell him every secret of the soul. Bring to him your difficulties, small and great, and he will show you a way out of them all. He alone can know how to give the very help you need. Now, in life, all of us at one point or another have been hurt by somebody. And as a result of this hurt, there have been like barriers put up between us and a person. And so there are many people in this world who are walking around with serious defects in their character primarily because they have trust issues. And not only do they have trust issues, there are certain, there are certain number of texts in the Bible, which we're going to look at right now, that would seem to vindicate the reason as to why we ought not to trust any man at all. For example, look at Psalm chapter 146. Verses 1 to 3. Psalms chapter 146, verses 1 to 3. Psalms chapter 146, verses 3 to 5, sorry. Psalms chapter 146, 
verses 3 to 5. It says, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. That's one text. Psalms chapter 118, verse 8. Psalm chapter 118, verse 8. It says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And then Micah 7, verse 5 says that it is, it is not good, basically, to trust in friends. So with all these texts, people would conclude that, see, the Bible says that at no point in time are we to put trust in man. Now, in the book, from the book Great Controversy, page 493, paragraph 1, it says, Before the entrance of evil, there was peace and joy throughout the universe. All was in perfect harmony with the Creator's will. Love for God was supreme, and love for one another impartial, which means that there was no favoritism. So as you know, Brother Michael has been touching on the angelic host. So when it says before the entrance of evil, there was peace and joy throughout the universe, it simply means that among the angelic creatures, there was no such thing as a trust issue. The only reason as to why we have trust issues with our brother, with our sister, with our spouse, with our church members, so forth, is only because of sin. Now, we do have evidence in the scriptures where it says that we are, we are not to trust man, we are not to put our trust in princes and so forth. But the fact of the matter is that what God wants us to understand is that there are two levels of trust that he wants us to have in this world. Number one, because of, the, because of the peace and joy that was throughout the universe and that eventually God is seeking to establish right now and eventually will be forever, there ought to be a specific harmony among the brethren. We're going to look at a couple of texts in a minute where it says that we ought to bear one another's burden. There's no way that we can bear one another's burdens if we do not trust each other. There's no way that we can have a school of prophets like this to have people present and so forth if we did not trust each other to hear what God had to say. So continuing, my character personality, volume 2, 4, 3, 1, paragraph 1. It says, we are all woven together in the great web of humanity. And whatever we can do to benefit and uplift others will reflect in blessing upon ourselves. So that means selfishness actually starves us. The law of mutual dependence runs through all classes of society. Now, as a, as a result of our natural human tendencies, we are told from the book, Ministry of Healing, 486, paragraph 7, we are prone to look to our fellow men for sympathy and uplifting instead of looking to Jesus. Now, based on that, look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. 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 It says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So basically what the Bible is saying that because we all go through a variation of difficulties and perplexities and so forth, in actuality we are to have each other's back. But the problem is that the trust that we have in man the trust that we have in man, or the trust that we have in God, we place it on man. And so instead of having a distinguishing line between how we trust man and how we trust God, the way that we should trust God, we put that trust on man. So then when man fails us now, we are so shocked saying, well, I thought you would have came through for me, when actually man is finite. Man is limited. That's why it says, in his mercy and faithfulness, God often permits those in whom we place confidence to fail us in order that we may learn the folly of trusting in man and making flesh our arm. Let us trust fully, humbly, unselfishly in God. He knows the sorrows that we feel to the depths of our being more than anyone else can, but that which we cannot express. When all things seem dark and unexplainable, remember the words of Christ. What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know eventually. Now, never, my character personality, 776, paragraph 2, never encourage men to look to you for wisdom, it's especially those who are in the work of the ministry. There are a lot of times where people will come to you for counsel. And because the Lord has blessed you with wisdom, 
if you and the Lord are not grounded, if you and the Lord do not have that personal relationship as Enoch did, you can feel naturally inclined to continuously lead that person to yourself rather than God. When in actuality, as Christians, the only role that we have is simply to take the person and lead them to Christ because Christ is the one who has the answers to all things. So it says, never encourage men to look to you for wisdom. When men come to you for counsel, point them to the one who reads the motives of every heart. Now, remember that the Bible does say, uh, does say that in a multitude of counselors, there's safety. But Christ is also called the mighty counselor. So that means that even though you can counsel with the brethren, there's a limit. And when that limit is reached, we have to pass it on to Christ. A different spirit must come into our minister of work. No persons must act as confessors. No man must be exalted as supreme. Our work is to humble self and to exalt Christ before the people. Now, based on this, we have to be very careful in who we confide in. Or to be, I, I saw this uh, picture on Facebook before. Be careful with who you confide in. Because a lot of times you can confide in someone thinking that that person is going to hold what you told them in, 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 in confidence. And actually, by the time you look, everyone knows your business. And not only that, but we are told, present these thoughts to the persons who come asking for your prayers. We are human. We are finite. We are limited. We are human. We cannot read the heart or know the secrets of your life. These are known only to yourself and God. If you now repent of your sin, if any of you can see that in any instance you have walked contrary to the light given you of God and have neglected to give honor to the body, see, dealing with sexual sin, honor to the body, the temple of God, but by wrong habits have degraded the body, which is Christ's property, make confession of these things to, uh, to God. Many times when, especially young people are interacting, you'll hear them say, well, tell me your deepest, darkest secret, as if that's something that, uh, that needs to be revealed. Unless you are wrought upon by the Holy Spirit in special manner to confess your sins of private nature to man, do not breathe them to any soul. Now, there are, Many, thing, many personal things about our life that ought never to be told to someone else. And only to, it, 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 it ought only to say between us and Christ. But a lot of times we pass that, that line, we pass that barrier, and begin to tell other people, and they should never have known those things about us at all. It says, I've been shown that many, many confessions should never be spoken in the hearing of mortals. Mortals say, meaning all Christians, anybody. For the result is that which the limited judgment of finite beings does not anticipate. It's eight Seeds of evil are scattered in the minds and hearts of those who hear. And when they are under temptation, these seeds will spring up and bear fruit, and the same sad experience will be repeated. Like, for example, with the, with the David situation. David was a man after God's own heart. If he can fall like that, why can't I? For, think the tempted ones, these sins cannot be so very grievous, for did not those who have made confession, Christians of long standing, people who are preaching and teaching, do these very things? So if someone who is in a leadership position can fall so greatly, if I fall, then it's really not that bad. Thus the open confession in the church of these secret sins will prove a savor of death rather than of life. My character and personality, 779, paragraph 3. Sometimes we pour our troubles into human ears, tell our afflictions to those who cannot help us, and neglect to confide all to Jesus, who is able to change the, the sorrowful way to paths of joy and peace. This is why it's important for us to understand how to walk with Christ as Enoch walked. Because in all facets of life, whether you're at school, whether you're at work, whatever you're doing, we ought to develop that relationship with Christ that we are speaking to him about literally anything. Because a lot of times we have a close friend and we speak to him about anything. So why can't we do it with Christ? The Human Desire of Ages, page 687, paragraph 3, dealing with Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. The human heart naturally longs for sympathy and suffering. This longing Christ felt to the very depths of his being. In the supreme agony of his soul, he came to his disciples with a yearning desire to hear some words of comfort from those whom he had so often blessed and comforted and shielded in sorrow and distress. So throughout the entire life of Christ, he was always blessing other people. 
He's always praying for people and so forth. But at this very moment, he was the one who needed help. It says the one who had always had words of sympathy for them was now suffering superhuman agony and he longed to know that they were praying for him and for themselves. How dark seemed the malignity of sin. Terrible was the temptation to let the human race bear the consequences of its own guilt while he stood innocent before God. If he could only know that his disciples understood and appreciated this, he would be strengthened. Ministry of Feeling 488, paragraph 4. It says, if you do not, if you do not feel lighthearted and joyous, do not talk of your feelings. In other words, a lot of times we feel so, so free to talk about negativity, not understanding that actually casts a shadow over whoever we're speaking to. A cold, sunless religion never draws souls to Christ. It pushes people away when we're constantly complaining, constantly speaking about negativity. It drives them away from him into the nets that Satan has spread for the feet of the string. Instead of thinking of your discouragements, think of the power you can claim in Christ's name. Let your imagination take hold upon things unseen. Let your thoughts be directed to the evidences of the great love of God for you. Faith can endure trial, resist temptation, bear up under disappointment. Jesus lives as our advocate. All is ours that his mediation secures. Ministry Philip 4, 87, paragraph 3. We need not keep our own record of trials and difficulties, griefs and sorrows. Sometimes we just like to recount all the bad things that has happened to us. All, all these things are written in the books, and heaven will take care of them. While we are counting of the disagreeable things, many things that are pleasant to reflect upon are passing from memory. We heard a song, Count Your Blessings, Name Them One by One. So a lot of times we're dwelling on, dwelling on negativity when in actuality we could, we, we could be thinking about the positive things that God has done for us, which always outweigh the negative. Such as the merciful kindness of God surrounding us every moment and the love over which angels marvel that God gave his son to die for us. Continued, if as workers for Christ you feel that you have had greater cares and trials than have fallen to a lot of others, remember that for you there's a peace unknown to those who shun these burdens. There is comfort and joy in the service of Christ. Let the world see that life with him is no failure. So basically in this short, short lesson, I believe that the Lord wants us to understand that a lot of times we tend to put our trust more so in man than we do in God. And this has negatively affected our relationship with Christ. And if we want to be like, you know, to walk with the invisible God, we have to have Christ as a constant companion, speaking with him moment by moment throughout our lives. So with that, we'll end with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your Sabbath day. We are thankful for your love, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you for your example in your son Enoch, O oh God. We thank you that you are not only our creator, our redeemer, our doctor, our lawyer, everything, O oh God, but we thank you that you are our friend. We thank you that you are a personal savior who cares about every single detail about our lives. There are many people who are afraid to have a relationship with you because they don't see you as someone who really stoop uh, that deep, that low, oh God. And we pray that you help us to understand that you love us more than we actually understand. We pray, Holy Father, that you will teach us how to establish a relationship with you through our daily lives. A lot of times we are very quick to call a friend or to, uh, or to call a church member to let them know what's going on in our lives. And you are just sitting there waiting for us to share whatever is going on with us, O oh God. And though you know everything about us, the only way that we can establish a relationship with you is if we communicate with you. Help us, Father, teach us how to have you as a constant companion. And we pray, Holy Father, that as we continue to worship you in spirit and in truth, that these lessons as seen in the life of Enoch, that you will help us to apply it to our daily lives. In Jesus' name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen.
Amen. What a refreshing study to see the importance of communion with God and of telling him, one of the things that really caught me was of telling him the little annoyances, the little things, and allowing him to take care of those things because in getting in the habit of doing that, then we'll be in the habit of sharing with him the greater problems and depending upon him for those greater problems. And those 144,000 in their daily life, they share with God their daily problems and their large problems so that when that great time of trouble comes, such as never was since there was a nation, that is why they're able to stand because they had a habit of having Christ as their constant companion. So it's my prayer. I mean, that thought is just so refreshing and so like soothing to the soul. It just makes you just relax a little bit so that you could have Christ as a companion. So it's my prayer that whatever it is that you receive tonight, that was certainly for me, that you may take that for the rest of this evening and on Pinterest and tomorrow and throughout the entire week and the rest of your life, to have Christ as your constant companion, to walk with him daily and to keep that, that, that level of trust always intact by his grace, and to share that same experience with your brothers and sisters as we look to impact this world. So this uh, closes our uh, class and study for tonight. So we uh, admonish all to join us again on Sunday, this coming Sunday at 4 p.m., where I'll be sharing my last study on the seven angels of Revelation chapter 14, the seven movements. Um, and we're going to be looking at the seventh angel. I believe it's going to be a great eye-opener. Um, surely it was to me. Um, and I believe that God is going to bring us to a place where we're going to say, we want to be ready. We want to be a part of that team. We want to be, finish the work as God has designed for us to do. So we close here. God bless you all. Have a happy, blessed Sabbath. And we look forward to seeing you again on this coming Sunday. So you may consider yourself dismissed. God bless.